And before I start, I want to give you a disclaimer. Those of you who know me and have heard me, they know this very, very well. Um, I kind of entered the field maybe 10 years ago now. Actually, it's my 10 years anniversary. Oh gosh, I'm getting old. Um, and as any research question, the deeper you dig, the more uneasy and the more, well, the more complexities you unearth. So I'm, I'm very uneasy by now to give introductory talks because they imply in some sense that this is how things are done here. This is how things should be done. But after digging for so long, I start realizing that uh, we haven't even scratched the surface of a lot of things. And I think the way quantum machine learning will be done in five years' time will be very different. And a lot of you guys out there might be the people who built this. So I want you to understand what I tell you today um, in the sense of this is what others have done with a huge bias of coming from the spaces they come from. Let's tear it down and come up with something better. But these are things you might want to consider from the older generation. Okay. Let's go right in. So I'll give you the insights. Um, the first one is that um, while there are a lot of ways of how to merge quantum computing with machine learning, uh, one of the major approaches you see today is that quantum circuits can be used as machine learning models, or more precisely as machine learning model classes. I'll tell you exactly what I mean by this. The second insight, this is very relevant for Penny Lane and all the things you will do in the coding challenges, is that we can train and in some sense, we, I could just say here optimize, but for quantum machine learning, a training is basically optimization with cost functions that depend on data. So I'm saying you train circuits with gradient-based methods. We will learn a bit about that. The third very big insight for me was the way you encode data into your problem matters to the extent that you can say sometimes it solves the entire problem. So you have to be very aware of how you start. Don't make that a random thing of your circuit design or model design, for example. Um, then there's the mantra that I uh, yeah, often uh, you know, say in, in my talks is that quantum models, we actually know kind of quite a lot about their mathematical structure. They're often called quantum neural networks. They do not look like quantum neural networks. They look like linear models in feature space. You learn what that means. And if you really want to, you can find cases of quantum advantage. But this will lead me actually to the second part of the talk about the missing things, because um, I'm by now quite aware that the way that we formulate advantage might be our biggest enemy in finding the way of how to use quantum computers for machine learning one day. This is an opinion that I have. A lot of my colleagues would present this very differently. But so here's like my take on um, why it's such an uncomfortable issue to find this quantum advantage we'll use one day. Um, the big holy grail is to find algorithms that are better than classical computing. And now in industry, very often we're interested in making them useful. By the way, if you're an academic, don't even worry about this. You can just be happy in the, you know, try to find quantum advantages that are abstract. But I start slowly understanding that there's a third puzzle piece here that we're often ignoring. We want our models also to be understandable because in order to build good foundations, we have to have motivations of the things we build. Um, and so this motivates quite a lot of what I want to put forward in, you know, very vague examples that I want to throw out there of what we are missing. I do think that the question of what are the right building blocks for our circuits, other than, for example, Pauli rotations, is still unanswered. This one is a very sore one. I think we have a big, big blind spot in terms of what are the measures of performance we should put out there. People just use classical data sets benchmark and um, you know just take the measures from other fields. But I think there is a lot of methodological work to do here, especially for the academic scientists. Um, and then the third question is, what is quantum is actually good for? And I think we are shying away from this question a lot. But uh, I think in the end, we should try to at least understand this, even if it means taking a step back. Um, I'm not so much doing this for self-advertising, but I have to credit also my um, co-author for this book because I took a lot of pictures out of this, so if you don't see any references, it's usually out of the book. And I know it's awfully expensive. Um, if you can't find it anywhere in the internet, then yeah, reach out and we try to make a plan. Okay, let's get into this. The first idea that I want to put forward is that quantum circuits can be used as machine learning model classes. And I use this also to give you a bit of an idea of the machine learning terminology that I need to talk about. This is the fruit fly example of uh, machine learning that people always put in the 101 talks. Um, that's image recognition. The reason people use it is that is the problem that got solved on a large scale around 2006 for the first time and showed that machine learning can actually do something absolutely crazy and just kicked off the whole revolution of why there's so much investment into the field. That is, you've got labeled uh, images, and now you get a new image that you haven't seen before, and the task for the computer is to guess the label. 
I want you to always think of two levels here. This level here is the level of reality or of your algorithm. You know, code never lies. This is what you have when you try to solve the coding problem. The data, the new data, you have to spit out an answer. But there's a mathematical modeling level. Sometimes it's a bit confusing. On the data side, your mathematical model is basically a distribution that you assume your data is drawn from. I don't know if this exists in real life, this distribution, but it's uh, very good to like uh, write this down or like think of the concept of this existing. And there are two types of this distribution you could consider in this type of problem for prediction. You could think of a distribution over the label uh, picture pairs. And then you could say these, these kind of pairs here are just drawn from this distribution. And if you have a high probability, you have a high probability of seeing exactly this, this picture. The second type of like this underlying abstract mathematical model could be that you actually draw only the images and then you've got a ground truth labeling function. So you assume the world has a function with which it determines the label. Um, and this is kind of the ground truth. Now, the computer is um, kind of having an idea or, or having an algorithm of how to guess cat. So this is on the realistic level. On the mathematical level, this algorithm is understood as a, as a model, actually a model class. I'll uh, tell you now what's the difference. But let me tell you like the type of models that you could think of for prediction tasks. Uh, the one you're very familiar with probably is just a function that takes like inputs and gives you a label. So that's very similar to this ground truth labeling function. And here your goal would be to match this one as close as possible to the abstract ground truth. Uh, but you could also have actually a distribution as a model class um, where you, uh, yeah, you again have a distribution over like what is the input and the label. It could be this kind of conditional distribution, which is a bit of a smaller distribution than the main one. Because if you have this distribution, you can infer basically this labeling function. I won't go into those details, but just what you have to take away is model class for prediction could be a function or distribution. I will talk more about the function here. And the whole idea of machine learning is then how do you match these two like abstract levels together? Um, then I said um, the term model is sometimes a bit confusing. Um, actually, it's uh, amazingly rich as a term. People use this for a specific function, for example, here f of x. But they also use the word model for a whole function class. And this is indicated by this little parameter here. So this f, this function, could be an entire parameterized model class. Um, for example, a neural network of a certain architecture. Um, examples for like a model class, they don't necessarily have to look like maths even. They don't even have to have continuous parameters. You could also say my model class are just these two models. If the first pixel is red, I say it's a one or a dog or like whatever, it's minus one, another classification label uh, otherwise. But obviously we're much used to having these parameters here being um, some kind of continuous uh, trainable weights. And what you see here is, for example, a two-layer neural network where you take the input as an image, think of it as, as uh, flattening your image that is in a computer just a matrix of, of values that describe the pixels, flattening it, doing some kind of linear transformation, which is a fancy way of saying you just multiply a matrix of weights to it, you do some kind of nonlinear transformation on what you get out, and you chain this layer-wise, and then you get a neural network. So it's basically just a transformation of your inputs to get kind of a label out. Um, there's a second class of models that's very interesting and very important, although in quantum uh, machine learning, it's not so well researched. Mm, and these are generative models, so I want to just mention them quickly. Here you've got just data points given, so these will be your images in another example. In this example now, our x's are just numbers, and the computer has to guess another of those numbers that is kind of consistent with the others. And again, what does consistent mean? We have to define this mathematically if we want to reason about it. And in this way, you would just say, okay, these numbers are drawn from a distribution. And what your model is in the machine is also like some kind of distribution or it's you know, a model class. You want to find the model out of this class. So basically these parameters here, you want to find the one where these match the best. And uh, examples for generative models could be you could have a distribution, a uniform distribution over all even numbers, over all multiples of four, over all powers to the two. All of these three models are consistent with your data that we saw. But you would obviously have very different uh, options for guessing what's uh, kind of like other data sampled from this distribution. And there's also this field called reinforcement enforcement learning, but it very often uh, incorporates the other learning fields. So um, the University of Leiden, Vitran Dunchko, they do fantastic work on like quantum reinforcement learning. I've done a lot of uh, work in this area, um, but it's much easier to think about the other two. So then 
just to summarize this, you can understand machine learning mathematically as the task of like you have data sampled from a data distribution, you have a model family, and now you have a cost that kind of compares the two and you want to minimize or find the model out of this family that minimizes this cost. And again, here we have this abstract level, find the model that minimizes the cost with respect to the entire distribution. But since I said this is just a mathematical object, this is just something that you, you have in your, yeah, you know, you don't have this in real life in your algorithmic task. What you do in real life, you try to find the model that minimizes the cost on just a small training set, so the samples that you see. And a lot of machine learning goes into like understanding how these two relate to each other. It's a fantastic field when you go theoretically into it. Now, how do we do this with a quantum computer? Um, without even knowing anything about quantum computing, although I assume for the rest of the talk that you know the basic concepts like circuits, measurements, and so on and so forth. But this is what you get from a quantum computer. You get samples of bit strings because we always do a very specific measurement in quantum computing, which is you know, known as a Pauli Z measurement. Um, and then you have to make sense out of this. Now, how can we use the quantum computer as uh, a machine learning model? In the case of the generative model, this is actually super simple and uh, very, very elegant. You just assume that these samples are taken from um, the quantum computer are samples from a generative model. So your entire quantum computer simply becomes a generative model. Um, so in some sense, you can just think of like the processing step and then the measurement step as um, you know, being the process that samples your data. Um, I'll introduce quickly this, this language here that I use throughout the talk. These on the upper left and the lower bottom means exactly the same thing, but here I invent some kind of like graphical linear algebra notation that I'll explain in a second. Up here you see quantum circuit. So this is what I mean in a quantum circuit language, um, which is how we like usually note quantum uh, computing circuits, uh, algorithms, like it's a graphical notation. It becomes so much second nature when you use it that you often forget that it's not entirely obvious. But you always like think of uh, starting in some kind of like initial state where qubits are initialized usually in zero, and then you apply some gates to these qubits uh, that are represented by unitary matrices in our mat mathematical formalism, and then there's some measurement. The mathematical description for these generative models looks a bit awkward, but um, what I mean by this here, you could start with a, um, a kind of like huge vector that corresponds to this first state that you're starting. So this is the quantum state, like written out as a vector. Um, and now you would apply unitary matrices. And now you would kind of have uh, uh, another vector where at the place of where your data point is, there is a one. And then you take the absolute square. So what does this do? This is just like a graphical notation of mathematics that gives you the probability of x, wherever this one is. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is there is a way of mathematically using quantum mechanics to describe what's happening in this model. Um, because some of you might be a bit more advanced, what I do, I insert a couple of questions into uh, the talk. So this one here is the first one to give to you. I'll comment very briefly on it at the end of the section, and then uh, we can discuss it later if you want. Um, the question will be, how can we prove a quantum advantage for generative quantum models? Okay, while some of you are thinking about this, we're going for the newbies into how can you make a, a prediction model with a quantum computer. Here, you have to encode data and you have to kind of get some label out. And this label can't be a sample. It has to be something stable, something deterministic. So what you do, or this idea, it's not entirely elegant if you think about it, but it, it works, um, is to take samples out of a quantum computer, but then you post-process them. You take some statistics about them. So for example, your average. How does this work? For example, if you get these samples, you say, my answer to my algorithm, to my model, my label is basically, the average of finding uh, of my first qubit. So basically the chance of finding my first qubit in state one. So this is another out output of my quantum algorithm. You could have something else like that have even parity. This is kind of how this works in the language that I try to, or picture language that I try to describe here. You need another building block. You need another part of the algorithm that encodes your data. Um, what you get out, we often write it as like kind of if your measurement is this, this kind of like observable is like signified by M, like the kind of these brackets that show you're, you're computing some expectation. This is the averaging process, getting statistics, statistical information out of your samples. And this is the way that in this linear algebra notation, quantum mechanics would describe exactly this function. So you have uh, some state, you, you apply matrices in the following fashion, and all of this will give you a scalar. This is the output of the function. A very important hint to some of you who work theoretically with this kind of stuff, um, 
there is a bit of arbitrariness of what you talk about as your encoding, your processing, and your measurement. And to give you an example, you could also understand this processing block here as just changing the basis of your measurement. Um, so what you basically implement is another measurement. And this, where this uh, language here with the, with the blocks of linear algebra comes in handy, because when you see up here in the last slide, you could just multiply these three matrices together. It's a Hermitian matrix, unitary matrix, unitary matrix gives you a motion matrix, and you could interpret this as a new measurement. So you could think of like the processing part being parametrized, so defining the model class, or you could think of actually the measurement defining the model class. But this is more an advanced comment if you don't understand this model. So if we take quantum computers as models, a huge range of question opens. How can we train these models? Um, how expressive are they? What does generalization theory look like in them? Where are the quantum advantages? How should we set up the architecture? So this is a lot of the papers that have been done. This is amazing progress actually that has happened. Um, I'm actually seeing, I won't, uh, oh yeah, maybe like, let me just very briefly comment on this one here. Um, you might immediately think a generative quantum model uh, could be, um, you know, you could show advantage in this generative quantum model by just showing um, a quantum supremacy experiment where you say, like, for example, drawing samples from a quantum computer are computationally hard for classical computers, and you could just use this experiment as a generative model, and then you would have an advantage. And here's an interesting hint, and this is why these questions are more for the advanced people. This is not the entire job done. Only because your model is classically intractable, it doesn't mean you can learn something from data in an intractable fashion. This is something that we can discuss like yeah, during the week if you like to on this call. Okay, so this was the longest section. Now I just have like a few highlights here. Um, if you use Penny Lane in the next days, you know that a big second insight, and it came actually from quantum machine learning, but it extends to lots of other fields like quantum chemistry, quantum optimization, is we can optimize or train circuits with uh, gradient-based methods. This is important in machine learning because your optimization landscapes are so high dimensional that you need some information on where to go in your training or in your optimization. And this gradients provides this information. Quick summary of this is, um, so if you have a cost, this is now this one comparing your model to whatever the ground truth was, for example, and this cost depends on parameters. Your gradient uh, contains the partial derivative of the cost with respect to the parameters. It gives a direction of steepest ascent. So you follow the negative gradient. And now you can play the game of just taking this, like um, I'm plugging in the maths that I had for the model for prediction, the quantum model for prediction. So this was from one of the previous slides. You can just see what is actually the partial derivative of this. And you see that you just uh, apply the product rule, um, and which gives you two terms. And this led, if you calculate this through, to something that we call now parameter shift rules. And what they actually mean is that if you have a quantum algorithm where you have somewhere an operation that depends on a parameter, and you want to get the partial derivative of the expectation value, this is a lot of jargon I use in one sentence, I know that. Basically, I just have to run the same algorithm twice, but I shift the parameter by some macroscopic shift. Um, and this is like one of the engines of Penny Lane, really, for example, and a lot of the um, you know, uh, quantum machine learning software frameworks. Uh, I'll skip this quickly, but uh, it means that we can, so it, it's crazy, this result, what it actually meant for the field in some sense, because it means that we can just take classical machine learning software, which is immensely powerful, and extend it by a quantum computation. And um, we're basically building really on the shoulders of giants here. And the reason that people can now really try quantum machine learning is partially this type of research. A quick comment, uh, when you import Penny Lane, Penny Lane can do more than just quantum machine learning, but we import it as QML. And it's kind of like, this is a bit of an honor towards this idea that Penny Lane, um, in Penny Lane, quantum computations are made differentiable, which is this paradigm of, machine, of modern machine learning. And it's, it's more than just a, an application. It's really like a, a paradigm of how to compute. And we want to make quantum computing really ready for this type of paradigm. This is a question we can discuss later. Um, does training by parameter shift rules scale in the number of parameters like backpropagation? Again, this is for the experts. Backpropagation is an algorithm to train neural networks. The answer is no. <laughs> we can discuss why. I just wanted to mention there's this phenomenon of barren plateaus, um, which basically I'm cutting this very short here, but a lot of research is looking into this. If you have very, very um, general model classes of your quantum circuits, so you don't actually take any like conscious decision of how to limit it, you just say, my quantum circuit is all unitary sample from a certain distribution that is very general. You get a problem, 
your optimization landscapes become flat? What does that mean? The gradients become small. What does that mean? Training becomes very, very hard or nearly impossible. So a lot of literature is published in that. Uh, but I'll just jump over that. Next little point, the way we encode data methods. That was for me a big eye opener. You can encode classical data in many ways into a quantum state. So if this is the way we write a quantum mechanics of quantum state, you could encode it into the amplitudes, you could encode it into the cupids in some sort. You could also encode it into your evolution. Uh, for example, um, so this is very typically how the, uh, an evolution of a quantum state looks like in, in maths language. Um, you can encode it in this object that we call the Hamiltonian or into like a parameter that scales the Hamiltonian that in physics we think of a time evolution. This one here would be, for example, this time evolution encoding would be to encode data into, for example, Pauli rotations is one example of this, for those of you who know what that means. The point I'm trying to make is whichever encoding you use, it changes your data entirely. I don't think this picture is like really so insightful, but uh, is, I try to kind of like use amplitude encoding, the encoding into qubits and this rotation encoding I spoke about and try to plot in this blosphere representation where your data uh, set, uh, in this case, a very simple data set would end, end up like. We can talk about like, uh, you know, how to represent multiple qubits. If they're unentangled, you can kind of like basically just write, uh, draw them like in, in single qubit fashion. What I want to try to say with this slide is that your data like looks completely different in this representation. We can understand this with a little mini model. If you just have one qubit, you do one rotation, you encode your uh, scalar data into this rotation by the rotation angle, and then you have like just a general rotation, and then you measure this like simple um, sigma z measurement which is just like basically asking is the qubit in state zero or one. This is kind of how the maths look like. So this is basically in maths now what I had in this like funny uh, block notation. Um, if you have, if you apply the rotation, you get kind of like a different vector and the entire expectation value would look like this one here. And the point I'm trying to make is in this model, you can add a lot of qubits and make this rotation here as big as you want. You can do the craziest quantum computation with thousands of parameters. The only thing in this function you will change is these prefactors here. You will still have a function that is basically a cosine of your data minus a sine of your data. You just rescale it. This is a very beautiful example to understand what you encode matters because you can throw at it all the power you want and it might not make a difference. There's uh, actually a whole free module in Penny Lane if you want to try it. It's a bit uh, under construction, but there's a theory um, behind this all that you can actually represent sub encodings quite nicely as, uh, as a Fourier series and you can kind of compute the Fourier coefficients of quantum circuit. Just aside. Next one quantum models look like linear models in feature space. This is a bit of an advanced idea, but I tried to explain it again with this uh, simple model we just saw. And I tried for now to explain it just with a picture. Um, if you kind of like now take data and you ask uh, in this like block um, uh, block representation, where would my data point, this data point be encoded? It would basically get mapped to this vector. This one here would get mapped to this vector and so on and so forth, but this operation up here. And if you now take the rotation, you basically just rotate all the data points. And this is very significant. So um, because what happens after you encoded your data is that you cannot easily perform operations that change the distance between the data points. Um, even your measurement introduces a slight nonlinearity, but you can see here that um, if you kind of plot on your velocity the states that would get mapped to one or something positive in blue and the states that would get mapped to something negative in red, you can see that the decision boundary, like the, the place where the classifier switches between the two decisions, is actually like something that looks almost linear, it looks very simple. So you can really like uh, understand very easily why um, data encoding is like so important and why also like um, in some sense like um, quantum circuits and quantum models um, have this idea of encoding data into like a huge vector and then performing a linear operation. Um, this one here is the same thing just in like this block notation uh, where you can see that applying this matrix to this initial state will just give you a vector that somewhat depends on your data and after that Mostly what you do, I mean, you have some kind of nonlinearity, a square nonlinearity in this expectation value, but other than that, you just rotate with matrices, you apply just uh, linear computations. Um, so what this means is that we can now really understand, and the details are a little bit subtle, and you can like look them up in these uh, papers if you like, um, but we can understand these quantum models not as neural networks, but as something that in classical machine learning is known as um, kernel methods. 
um, that map data into high dimensional spaces and then decide, like uh, de define hyperplanes as decision boundaries. Um, for those of you a bit advanced and want to challenge, like should you use amplitude embedding to classify non-linearly separable data? That would be a question. The answer is again, no. <laughs> should I set them up? Okay, I skipped those. I just wanted to like highlight a bit the um, connection to uh, classical machine learning here. But um, one thing I want to highlight before I, I finish this section is um, there are ways to kind of force quantum circuits to look more like neural networks, and there's fantastic work on that. It is still a bit of a question of where do we want to go with this? So um, yeah, let's discuss this if you're interested in it. Okay. And then lastly, um, if you really want to, you find cases of quantum advantage. I think it would be unfair to like um, kind of just skim over this uh, very amazing results of quantum machine learning of the last couple of years, where people have taken um, a lot of the results we know from quantum computing. So for example, if you know that Scholl's algorithm is very unlikely to have a classical algorithm that, that has the same complexity scaling uh, as the quantum algorithm. So you can take these results and like plug them to some extent into machine learning. And amazing things have been made there. Um, the holy grail, however, that's still up is this idea of a practical provable quantum advantage. And again, I say this is very much inspired by us from industry, like doing a lot of work and research in this field, because this is when we build quantum computers, the use case that we that we use them for. And it has to some extent like really like um, influenced the field of quantum machine learning, where you know in academics you could just like lean back and say, I'm doing interesting things, but at the moment uh, a lot of quantum machine learning is driven by the industry that really is interested in this practical advantage. A lot of papers like talk to it about advantage in one way or the other. Um, you have to know that there are different ways to actually find advantages. It could be a practical benchmarking where you show oh, your quantum model behaves in like some other fashion than the classical model. It could be a provable complexity result where you show like the algorithm of your quantum model grows slower in the size of the input than the classical model. It could be other measures of complexity or generalization bounds, which are theoretical measures of like how good your algorithm is from the classical machine learning. Um, you could also think of the expressivity of a model class, although I think a lot of mischief has been done here because it's not entirely clear how this relates to performance. So there's a lot um, that has been done here. Well, I'm so critical about this, and this is what I will close with in the next couple of minutes, um, is that in my personal uh, opinion, the windows we have to answer the question of advantages that everyone's so interested in are very, very small. Um, some of you might remember the slide from last year's uh, QHack where I talked about this a little bit more. Oh, and it's still the same spelling mistake, I can't believe it. Um, so we have the window of like running our uh, quantum algorithms on simulators or existing hardware. This is what you do if you like, uh, you know, kind of like run something, for example, on Lane or on Qiskit. Um, or you can go the theoretical route and like analyze the runtime theoretically, like using computational complexity tools or, or something like that. But there are very small windows into what a quantum computer can do. And if we only had those windows, and this is the critical point, we wouldn't be able to actually find the machine learning algorithms that are running today. Neural networks would have never been found because the computational complexity is like unclear of those, those models. On small data sets, they don't perform well. So I do not think we're able to probe the regimes that we're interested in. So what we are really missing is like, in my mind, this idea of not just connecting better algorithms and useful algorithms, but making everything, like going a step back and understanding why actually we want to do the things. Three questions that you could consider if you want to like, uh, if you join me in like kind of thinking about it this way, what are actually the right building blocks for quantum circuits? Does it have to be Pauli rotations? Could it not be something like a Gibbons rotation, which looks similar, but does something slightly different? Or it could be something like on the pulse level of like uh, how we implement quantum computing in hardware that you parameterize. Could you have multiple measurements, for example, not only like using a straight sigma z measurement? So we haven't started playing with these building blocks. One of the reasons, um, oh yeah, I skipped this one. One of the reasons why we haven't done this is the second point, because we do not really know often what the right measures of performance are. So very often you see in papers this kind of like plot where you have like uh, show that your model, my quantum model, is like on MNIST, which is a, a machine learning data set that people used maybe ten years ago in classical machine learning to, to benchmark their models, and you just show oh my quantum model is better. But are these imported measures really what we should do? They are um, generated for completely different tasks. So which benchmark data sets can we use? Which methods of verifying our methods? What are the scopes of these methods? So there's um, a lot of open questions to me.
And especially because machine learning is pushing in a completely different scale than quantum machine learning at the moment. So what we find here might not apply at all to the problems where machine learning is pushing. So there's a couple of rules, I think, to choose your ben benchmarks in your papers with a purpose. Be more honest in like discussing the scope of results. So I think we should really change our, our the way that we do science here. And the last one is what is actually quantum most good for? Um, if you're not coming from quantum mechanics, you might not know this, but classical simulatability is only one measure of how to measure what's quantum and what's classical. You could also have measures like non-locality, contextuality, discord, and all these things from quantum foundations. And they give you different boundaries. And we're at the moment stabbing at this blue boundary, but maybe understanding some of the other ones would really make us understand when to use quantum computing for a problem and uh, when to use classical computing. And not having this understanding at all, or not even under trying this is uh, to me like a big omission. The problem is that um, you immediately, oh gosh, excuse me for this like really bad pixel image, but um, that you really have to go back to the foundations. You have to go to this language where people use Alice and Bob and set up these very strange experiments and you have to kind of unite them with machine learning. And this is not, not easy. So that's it from my side. I hope you take away, um, you know, a couple of insights from, from quantum machine learning. You have also learned that you didn't know before that at least some people like me are a bit uneasy about um, where we are at the moment. Um, and I think we should open the discussion. I hope that um, the new generation of quantum machine learning researchers will realize how to make things work in a very, very different manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, this was incredible. I love how you transform a topic that could be considered complicated or difficult for some, and you turn it into something so easy. And I love how you <laughs> use images. <laughs> You don't know, Catalina, you're doing quantum computing for a while now, but uh, when you do it for many years, you you lose the sight of what's actually easy and what's difficult. It's a bit like walking, you know, when you have the baby and it starts walking, you forget what's hard about walking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. But uh, honestly, you do an amazing job. And uh, everybody here in the chat is thanking you for that because this was incredible. Very welcome. Um, I do have some questions for you on a different topic, uh, but relating to a baby to uh, walking, right? Um, so you're a huge influence for people all around the world. And uh, especially as a new mom, like me being as a woman, I see you as a role model. Uh, there's so much that we can achieve. And um, I want to ask you, how was your experience uh, as a new mom coming back to work? <laughs> yes, it's this experience is very specific to everyone. You know, has something to do with the personal circumstances, with everything. My experience was a super big surprise. I thought if I go on maternity leave, which was half a year for me, um, afterwards I might come out and think, oh, I should do something completely different. Or I don't want to work anymore or whatever, because you know, once you're away, maybe you, you rethink. But I started really loving science again. I even went to two conferences with the baby <laughs> and uh, just somehow. And getting back to work was actually a lot of fun because, um, I mean, I'm unbelievably tired, but... Um, this idea of like having playing with your child for three hours, then working for four hours, then playing with your child for three hours, then working like another, I don't know, four or five hours. It just switches the context so much and you feel so rich. I am unbelievably tired though, I hope everyone <laughs> can see this. <laughs> oh, we cannot see it and I love hearing this from you. It's really exciting to like to hear that from you and motivating. Um and also, I know that you don't only really have a baby and a job, but you also have a new gardening hobby. And I'm a plant lover <laughs> myself, so I want to hear more about that. Oh, gosh, yeah. During my maternity leave, I picked up. So I thought, like, I should learn new things if I kind of had the time. And, um, well, having the time is relative, but you know how this goes. And we moved into a house that has a huge uh, jungle as a back garden. And I picked up gardening, which sounds simple, but it's literally just fighting hornets, chopping down trees, uh, moving earth, and uh, yeah, starting to learn about how to look after soil. And uh, it's been very, very eye-opening what land means. I understand now why land is at the center of so many conflicts of humans, because it's really something that transforms you if you work land, I think. Yeah, I also took up a hobby of um, learning about South African history, which uh, is, was very not obvious to me, although I thought I knew a lot about it. And um, yeah, this is nice, this kind of hunger when you sometimes like get out of your job, you get hungry for other things again. And uh, so I can recommend taking these um, breaks in your life uh, very much if you can somehow. They are very inspiring. Yeah, definitely uh, something you should at some point try in your life, right? Um, whether it's maternity leave or something else, 
uh, <laughs> taking a break can be useful. Like, uh, yeah, definitely opens your mind to new things. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the chat as well. So I'm going to get through a couple of them. Uh, we have a question from Jack MHX asking, is there an idea of which encoding is best for which uh, problem spaces? Yeah, no, not so. I have been gone for a while, so please correct me if there are papers that solve this issue. But I have the thing: not only do we not know this, I feel that not many. I mean, some papers try to tackle it, um, but it's such a general question that um, I think you have to get a lot more um, down to you know the details. So, for example, if you're if your problem is something that has a symmetry, this is something that's very famous at the moment to look into symmetries and quantum circuits that respect these symmetries. And we hear more about this in the end of the week, like from uh, Marco Cereso. Um, for example, you could say like, I want my encoding also to respect the symmetry. Or, or if you have an image, then you might know that something that has this idea of convolutions from convolution in your networks would work. <clears throat> so these little um, steps we have taken, and I think you see them everywhere. But on a very general basis of saying, like, what type of problems are actually these Pauli encodings that everyone uses? You know, everyone just rotates their qubits by an angle that's proportional to the features of their machine learning problem. What does this actually do? Is this useful? Why should we do this? I feel this is very often skimmed over. And to me, since it's, we know that it's such a central part of an algorithm <clears throat> and of solving a machine learning problem, I find this is almost like screaming into my face all the time. And uh, I'm a bit embarrassed that in five years' time, we are still so blind towards that. So I hope that uh, more work is coming out on that. So I can't answer this question very in this general sense at all, <clears throat> unfortunately. Actually, I think this is a huge motivation for people first to try different codings and to do more research in how can we use encoding. So it's a positive, I see it as a positive thing that there's still uh, ground to cover. There's still stuff to oh. discover. Yep. By the way, so this is a nice example where um, I sometimes say like, looking for quantum advantage instead of understanding is in our way. And people get very confused and sometimes very angry about this. But this is a very good example. We know encodings that expose a quantum advantage, but we do not know, understand if the encodings we use all the time are actually useful for machine learning. Or we don't even understand in which framework we should analyze this question. So their advantage has like sapped up a lot of the energy that might have gone into understanding things, from which point we could maybe look at quantum advantage from a completely different angle. So just to add this, sorry. Yeah, excellent. Excellent thing to add. Um, we have a question from 6QBZ. Which university did you mention that does quantum reinforcement learning? So which group? Yeah, that's Leiden University Vetran Dunchko. So he's one of the very early, uh, in my original slides, I had a photo of a 2016 QML workshop, uh, which was one of the first ones, and he was actually there. So he's a veteran of the field, and he's uh, also a fantastic human and yeah, person. So Okay, awesome. More. Great. So if you're interested in quantum reinforcement learning, you know where to go. Um, we also have a question uh, that asks, I'm very interested in talking to you about quantum neural networks. How can we have this conversation later? <laughs> so what I do after this now, I'll be on Discord for um, another while. So maybe we can um, chat there. I don't know if there are private messages that you allow, but we can talk in the channel there. And otherwise you can send me an email. So you can see my email address here. I'm not very quick at the moment in replying, but I will reply. Okay, you can see it there yes. on the screen. Uh, Maria at Zenil.ai. And uh, I would encourage you, though, to go to Discord. So uh, we will share the it's link nice to the Discord. Cool. We will share the link to the Discord here in the chat. Make sure you uh, take a, take a good look at the, at the link on the Discord. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so we can ask more questions. And for everybody in the chat, make sure to keep asking questions. Um, OK, so we yeah, have. If you yeah? If you're also are interested to discuss the questions I pitched through the talk, I find them, if you want to do QML research and you're not sure about the answers to them, uh, these are very fundamental ones that could help you to get uh, get rid of a couple of confusion items. And uh, we can discuss this in Discord as well if you want to. Yeah, that would yeah. be that would be incredible. I think everybody's going to jump here through the Discord. <laughs> um, OK, so. Um, we have a question from Angel Angelina Linux 74. 
It seems to me that QML models can work only on binary classification problems. For example, taking the measure of the first qubit or even parity of output qubits. Is that true? Can we study multi-class classification or regression and how? Um, yes, so there are many ways of how to do multi-class classification. The first thing to note is why people are skimming over this, they're not so interested in this, is any multi-class classification problem, you can turn into binary classification problems. So you can always ask, is it this or not? Um, so this is why when you solve the one, you have in theory solved the others as well to some extent. Uh, yeah, but there are lots of papers where you say, for example, uh, I encode into different regions of my qubit, I encode answers, or um, you could use, uh, you know, you could measure multiple qubits and understand the bit string of the highest um, probability to be observed as the answer. And then, you, you know, every bit string has a different class that it encodes. So there are lots of ways. Okay, great. Make sure to keep asking your questions. Uh, so we have a question from Yan Teng. Uh, a question on the gradient with parameter shift. How does one get the expectation value from classical machine learning models? If we simulate the distribution classically in a certain basis, this scales unfavorably with the system size. How does one scale the quantum network? Oh gosh, can you repeat this? So <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know if I grasped the, the just... I, I think there are two yeah. questions in one. So yeah. okay. the first question is how to get the expectation values from a machine learning model. But yeah. like the, so, yeah, yeah, that would be question yeah, so, number one. Yeah, so the classical machine learning models, so this getting an expectation or using the expectation value of some samples as, um, you know, a prediction is basically just a crutch we have to implement because what we get of our quantum computers are samples. A traditional neural network would not give you samples, it would just give you uh, an output that's just a number. So it doesn't need to take expectations. And this is actually very, very crucial. So if you, um, see quantum models that try to emulate something like a neural network like for prediction, there's always a statistical process behind it that you get lots of samples. So there's something very costly we have to do. So one output means many measurements. In classical machine learning, we would just compute a number and that's the number. So uh, expectations is kind of like a term that's more applies to the quantum models rather than the classical models. Yeah, and I think the key here is we talk a lot about expectation values, but we don't necessarily know what they are. And it's a key concept in math, right? So you can go to Google and look for what is an expectation value and it will answer a it lot of your questions, right? It confused the hell out of me. So the concept of a quantum state confused me for probably five years. And the concept, you know, what is the state? Where is the information? And why can I just change a basis and then the numbers change? What does it do with the information? And it really takes a feel, not just an understanding, but really a feeling for linear algebra to, to get this. And the second one is this expectation where it took me almost well, probably like seven, eight years until I was really clear that it's literally just you take samples and there's some averaging process. And it's nothing fancy. It's just a statistical word that we use. Um, so I really encourage you to take away like a week of your time and just just look at measurements and what they do and what you get and, and how this works with the maths. And then, uh, yeah. It yeah. Work. yeah. And look at different materials. I would encourage people to do that because different frameworks talk about uh, samples in a different way, right? So in Penny Lane, for instance, a sample will be a number between either one or minus one, depending on uh, whether you measured on the positive or negative uh, basis. Let's say it's a computational basis, right? Did you uh, get a measurement on the positive or negative z-axis, right? So it's a plus or minus one. But if you go to Qiskit, for instance, you'll get a zero or one. And so this can be confusing. Like, what does this one mean? And what does this minus one mean? And why is it different? And how does that uh, compute if you get an expectation value? Uh, so it's good to look at different resources. Of course, we have a ton of educational resources at Penny Lane, but I would encourage people to check different so that you can get a better sense of what this is. And uh, maybe from the algorithm side, um, I mentioned it, but this turning samples into a number, so this, this step of, of doing some post-processing has a huge cost. So never forget this in your algorithm. I sometimes do this, like when, for example, we have a Penny Lane tutorial on like, kernel methods and how many shots do you need for ABC and um, you know afterwards I realized oh there's actually like another layer where for every every output of my quantum circuit I need to make a lot of measurements just to average over them and get like this number up so um, 
this is confusing. So if you don't understand it right now, don't worry. But um, yeah, make an effort because it really is a, an investment into understanding these algorithms very well. Yeah, and it can clarify a lot of things for later on. Uh, so the second part of the question was about scalability and a little bit about uh, comparing uh, scalability and numbers in the system size with a classical and quantum computer. Um, I'm not sure if I will answer this question, but um, it uh, is like a, a very interesting uh, question like to, to ask about like how to compare even those. Because so for example, when you have a paper that wants to prove that there's an advantage of their quantum model, they often have to compare the two, right? And uh, you have to really read the fine print there of what they compared with. For example, I could say, oh, I compare my quantum model with a neural network that has the same number of parameters, or it has the same number of layers, or it has a similar feature space, whatever that is. Um, and obviously what we take as a comparison, so what you never see though in papers is someone systematically discussing what it means to compare against that model and not another one. So or you hardly ever see it. Um, so basically like how you compare and then, then also making conclusions about how well your algorithms scale, which really depends on what you compare to each other, is also another thing that I would say is a methodological blind spot that uh, should be looked at much more intensely. Yeah. Well, uh, our time is up, Maria, but I want to thank you so much for being here, everyone. You uh, know that Maria is going to be on Discord, so make sure to go there and uh, chat with her. Uh, or uh, you can email her as well if you have questions. If you want to learn more about quantum machine learning, if it was just for you, uh, we have a lot of educational material in Penny Lane. It's something we're very proud of. And Maria herself was has done a lot of <laughs> tutorials and contributed a lot uh, in review as well. Uh, so there's a lot of places where you can uh, learn. Uh, we're going to uh, share some in the chat. If you have other resources, share them here in the chat, in the Twitch chat, and we can all get a good database of places to learn more about quantum machine learning. Lovely. Thank you so much, Catalina, for your very, very kind uh, moderation. And to you guys, a lot of fun and enjoy the talks. I will surely yeah, tune in myself. <laughs>